Welcome to Free Thoughts from Libertarianism.org and the Cato Institute. I'm Trevor Burris. And I'm Aaron Powell. Joining us today is Thomas C. Leonard, research scholar at the Council of the Humanities at Princeton University and lecturer at Princeton University's Department of Economics. He is the author of the new book, Illiberal Reformers, Race, Eugenics, and American Economics in the Progressive Era. Welcome to Free Thoughts. Thanks. It's nice to be with you. So I'd like to start with the, the title, uh, which is, says a lot by itself. Uh, why illiberal reformers? Well, everyone knows uh, that the scholars and activists who dismantled laissez-faire and built the welfare state uh, were reformers. Um, they don't call them – they don't call it the progressive era for nothing. Um, but it's my claim uh, that a central feature of that reform, a central feature of um, erecting the regulatory state, a, a new kind of state, uh, was the um, traducing of, 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 of liberties uh, in the name of various conceptions of the greater good. Not just um, economic liberties, property rights, contract, and so forth. Um, that's, that's sort of a well-known part of the transition from 19th century liberalism to 20th century liberalism. But also, I maintain uh, civil and personal liberties as well. And what time period? I mean, so are we talking about just after the turn of the century or the turn of the 20th century or going back further than that? Well, the, the ideas, uh, the architecture, if you will, uh, the blueprints were drawn up um, sort of in the last decade and a half of the 19th century and they gradually made their way into actual sort of legislation and in institutions, uh, government institutions in the first two decades of the 20th century, um, sort of uh, to use the usual scholarly terms, kind of late Gilded Age uh, and then the Progressive Era. So who, who are these people, these uh, reformers? Uh, are, they, are they politicians mostly or are they, are they in some other walk of life? Um, eventually they're politicians uh, but the politicians have to be convinced first. Um, so the, the the convincers in the beginning are a, a, a group of intellectuals, um, or if you like, um, scholars. Um, they are um, economists, uh, sociologists, um, population scientists. Uh, so are those like are population scientists are those basically Malthusians or <laughs> uh, no? Today we call <laughs> we don't them use that term anymore. <laughs> we call them what? No, today? Uh, no. Uh, today we would call them demographers. Oh, okay. <laughs> but, yeah. um, it's it not quite doesn't have to sound that sinister. Uh, but one of the interesting things, uh, Trevor, about um, social science in this kind of in its very beginnings in in the late nineteenth century is it's it's it. it it's only beginning to become an academic discipline, which is part of uh, the book's story. And a, and a lot of social science, kind of social investigations, um, fact-finding, uh, research reports, uh, it, it, a lot of that's being done outside the academy uh, in the immigrant settlement houses, uh, to a lesser extent uh, in government administrative agencies. Uh, in investigations funded by the brand new foundations, and eventually in this brand new um, invention called the think tank. <laughs> Was this increasing influence by these people who are ultimately working as largely academics? Was this new for academics? Were were academics this influential before this? Um, no, it it is new. It's uh, it's a revolution. In, in academia, um, if 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 we could transport ourselves backwards in time to uh, Princeton, say in 1880, um, we wouldn't recognize the place. Um, American colleges, you know, in the immediate just after the Civil War, uh, were were tiny institutions. Um, they weren't particularly scholarly. They were denominational. Um, they were led by ministers. Um, in Princeton's case, they would have been finishing Southern gentlemen. Um, and you wouldn't recognize it at all. Uh, if, however, we could transport ourselves back to, say, 1920, um, just 
at the end of the progressive era, um, you would recognize everything about the place. Um, the social sciences have been invented and installed. There's the beginning of, of um, the physical sciences as in, in academia. And it's no longer just uh, the classics, um, theology, and a little bit of philosophy and mathematics. Uh, part of the story of the rise of um, reform is the story of this revolution in American higher ed, um, which takes place between 1880 and, and 1900. In, in the book, you discuss how Germany figures into this to some degree, which I thought was kind of interesting because Germany also figured into reforming our, our public education below higher ed. But, but the Germany, Germany's status in the intellectual world was very influential on, on Americans in particular. Yeah, that's quite right. Um, the German connection is is crucial for understanding the first generation of economists and and uh, other other reformers um, in the 1870s and in, and into the 1880s. If you wanted to study cutting edge political economy, um, Germany was where you went. And all of the founders of American economics, and indeed uh, most of the other sort of newly hatching social sciences. Uh, did their graduate work um, in Bismarckian Germany. And it's only sort of beginning in the 1890s that uh, American higher ed catches up. But boy, does it catch up quickly. Um, that's why we use the term revolution. By the turn of the century, um, the, you know, the number of graduate students in the United States um, getting PhDs is, is in the thousands um, you know, sort of after the Civil War or even as late as 1880, it would have just been a handful. So what did these people start thinking about? I mean these, these, these illiberal reformers, what, what did they get in their head partially from Germany, partially from other sources we could, which we can talk about later? But in, in the sort of general overview, uh, when they looked at society, what did they sort of – maybe not suddenly but at that moment, what did they decide they wanted to do with it? Well, another thing to – to understand is that most of them, in addition to sort of having this German model of how an economy works and also a German model of how an economy um, should be regulated, they were also um, evangelical Protestants. Uh, most of them grew up in evangelical homes. Um, most of them were sons and daughters of ministers or missionaries, and they had this you know this extraordinary zeal, um, this, this desire to set the world to rights. And they looked around them um, during the Industrial Revolution and they saw what really was extraordinary, unprecedented um, economic and social change, uh, which we kind of gather under the, the banner of the industrial, or at least the American Industrial Revolution. And when they looked around them, they saw um, injustice. They saw low wages. There was a newly visible class of the poor in the cities. They saw inefficiency. Um, they saw labor conflict. They saw um, uneducated men getting rich. Um, and the, this upending of the old social order, um, in their view, uh, was not only inefficient, it was also unchristian and immoral, and it needed to be reformed. And they were sort of, it's important to say, unabashed about using evangelical terminology. Um, they referred to, this is the first generation of progressives, they referred to their project as um, bringing a kingdom of heaven to earth. Then how did they – so they, they've got this project. They've identified these issues that they want to change. <clears throat> how did they go about turning that concern and the expertise that they thought they had into control of the reins of power or influence within government? Great question. Uh, it wasn't easy. <laughs> they, they, they understood that um, they had a tall task in, in front of them. Um, they had to persuade those in power that um, 
reform was needed and reform was justified. And it, it helped that um, two of their students, Theodore Roosevelt and, and Woodrow Wilson, uh, went on to fame as, as politicians, and, and so did other progressives at, at, at lower levels too. And part of the idea of, of academic economics um, in, in this sort of uh, beginning stage was that um, you didn't just uh, spend time in the library or do blackboard exercises. Your job was to go out and, and make the world a, a better place. Um, so I, I think the, the best way to think about it was they, uh, a, along with many other reformers, um, wrote for the newspapers, uh, went on the lecture circuits, uh, bent the ear of uh, politicians, uh, first at the state level and then uh, later at, at the federal level, and said, um, it's a new economic world. Uh, the old economic ideas, laissez-faire as they called it, are um, not only is it immoral, it's, it's economically obsolete. And we need to build um, a new relationship, uh, not unlike uh, the model that Germany provided between the state and economic life. And very gradually, uh, it happened. And we're talking about also the emergence of the administrative state comes into this too because then they can take over posts in government that are not necessarily elected where their expertise is supposed to be utilized. That's exactly right. Um, the, the crucial point is that we, we think about the progressive era as a, as a huge um, expansion in the size and scope of government um, and indeed it is that. But the progressives didn't just want bigger government. Um, they also wanted a, a new kind of government, which they saw as, as a better form, as a superior form of government. They, um, famously, the progressives weren't just unhappy with um, economic life, which um, was one thing. They were also unhappy with American political life. Uh, and with American government, which they saw, and, and rightly so, uh, as corrupt and inefficient and uh, not doing what it should be doing uh, to improve society and economy. So they wanted to um, not only to expand state power, but also to relocate it, uh, to move um, – government authority away from the courts, which traditionally had held uh, quite a bit of, of regulatory power, and away from legislatures and into um, what uh, they sometimes called uh, a new fourth branch of government, the administrative state. And you write, you write in your book, which I think this was a very succinct way of putting it, progressivism was first and foremost an attitude about the proper relationship of science and its bearer, the scientific expert, to the state and of the state to the economy and polity. And so the, these experts – I also want to think we should make clear uh, this was not a fringe group of intellectuals and academic professors. This was – would you say it was the mainstream or at least a, a kind of who's who of American intellectuals at all the great Ivy League institutions? Absolutely. Uh, it's, it's the best and brightest if I can use a, an anachronistic phrase. Now, we have to be a little careful with, with Ivy League because the, the centers of academic reform are um, at places like uh, Wisconsin and to some extent at Columbia and at Johns Hopkins and to some extent at Penn. But the old colonial colleges like Harvard and Yale uh, were a little late to catch up. It took them a while to catch on to this new German model of graduate seminars and, and professors as, as experts and, and not merely instructors. So how did they conceptualize the average, the average worker that needed their help? You have this great line. Uh, in your book, which I think says something about modern politics too. Progressives did not work in factories. They inspected them. Progressives did not drink in saloons. They tried to shudder them. The bold women who chose to live among the immigrant poor in city slums called themselves settlers, not neighbors. Even when progressives idealized workers, they tended to patronize them, romanticizing a brotherhood that they would never consider joining. Yeah, 
I, I think it's fair to say, and, and it's not exactly a revelation, that the, the progressives uh, were, were not working class. Um, but neither were they, um, uh, you know, part of the gentry class. Uh, they were um, middle class uh, and, and from middle class backgrounds, as I say, sons and daughters of, of ministers and missionaries. So um, they were unhappy when they looked upward at the new uh, plutocrats who were uneducated and, and in their view, um, unchristian and uh, potentially corrupting of the republic. And, uh, but they also didn't like what they saw when they looked downward at ordinary people, particularly at, at immigrants. Um, and um, if you don't mind, I, I, just, I, I feel like I should circle back to this, uh, fourth, state, uh, this fourth branch idea as, as a conception of the administrative state. Um, I didn't finish my thought very well. Um, I think that um, the way that the progressives thought about the fourth branch is is very important um, because the administrative state, as as everyone knows, has done nothing but grow since its um, blueprinting in uh, and its sort of first construction in, in Woodrow Wilson's first term. I think the key thing. Well, sort of there's two key, key components that make this a new uh, kind of government um, in the progressive mind. Uh, the first is that the, the independent agencies like the Federal Reserve and the Federal Trade Commission and um, uh, the Permanent Tariff Commission were designed to be independent of Congress and, and the president. Uh, that, that that was by design. They were supposed to be, in, in some sense, above politics. They had, they served for seven years. They had overlapping terms. Uh, often, case, uh, oftentimes, they would be um, balanced uh, uh, politically, um, and uh, the president could not remove uh, one of these commissioners uh, except for cause. Um, and neither could Congress impeach them. So they 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 occupied a kind of a unique place, uh, a new uh, place. Uh, did these um, bureaucrats? The second uh, thing that matters, I think, for understanding the administrative state, is is that um, administrative regulations have the full force of federal law. Right, uh, regulations are, are laws, uh, no different than if uh, you know Congress had passed one. Um, moreover, uh, the fourth branch, uh, the, the administrator, administrators are also responsible for executing regulations, and third, of course, they're responsible for adjudicating regulatory disputes. So there's this combination of statutory and adjudicatory and executive power all rolled up into one, which is why I think um, the progressives called it the fourth branch. And the growth of administrative government, uh, I think, is a, is, is, a much, is a much better metric for thinking about the success, if you will, uh, or the durability of the progressive vision than simply looking at something like government spending as a share of GDP. Can we decouple, at least for purposes of critique, the the ideology of the progressives from the methods? Because obviously they they ended up once they had the power, ended up doing a lot of really lamentable or awful things with it. But the basic idea of having experts in charge of things, I mean, you, you can see a certain appeal to that, especially as you know. Science advances, technology advances. We our body of knowledge grows. We understand more about the economy and more about how societies function. Like just like you would want, you know, experts in the medical sciences overseeing your health as opposed to just laymen. Is there anything just inherently wrong or dangerous about the idea of turning over more of government to experts, distinct from just the the particular ideas of this set of experts? I don't think so. I think the the, the question is um, more uh, more a practical one of of what we think experts should do, whether they're working uh, in government or in in the private sector, and um, the, the progressives uh, had a 
what you might call a heroic conception of expertise. Um, they, they believed uh, that they not only could the experts uh, serve the public good, but they could also identify the public good. And, and that, that's what I mean by a heroic conception. And say, not only do we know how to get to a particular outcome, we, we know also uh, what those outcomes uh, should be. Um, now, there, there's nothing about expertise per se that requires that uh, heroic vision, which in retrospect looks both arrogant and, and naive. Um, it makes good sense for the state to call a, a, upon expertise um, where expertise can be helpful. Um, so I don't think it's an indictment of the very idea of, of using science um, for the purposes of state. Uh, it's more about what sort of authority and, and um, we, we want uh, experts to have. And going as we sort of move into uh, the New Deal era, which is another great growth spurt in the size of, of, of the state, um, we get a slightly less heroic uh, vision of what experts do. Um, there's, um, well, after World War I, um, the, that, that sort of naive, heroic view of expertise uh, is, is simply outmoded. So they, they definitely um, – they're pretty arrogant as you mentioned. Uh, they have – so, so I'm going to ask you sort of a, a few things about about the way that they're looking at society and what they think that they can do with it and and what they are allowed to do with it. Um, so, how do they view individual rights in this? And as a corollary, I guess, um, what do they? How do they think of society as opposed to the individual um, in terms of the sort of methodology of their of their science or statecraft or whatever you want to have you describe it. That's a great question. I, I, I think one of the most dramatic changes that we see um, in sort of American liberal thinking in this transition from 19th century small government uh, liberalism to 20th century liberalism of a more activist, um, expert-guided state is a reconception of um, – the what Dan Rogers calls the the moral whole, the idea of a nation uh, or a state or a social organism as an entity that is something greater than the individual people uh, that make it up, and I think this um, this fundamental change is is one of the sort of key elements in, in, in this progressive inflection point in, in American history. Um, up until that point, uh, if you're willing to call an era a point, um, forgive me, up until that moment, I think that's what we should, we should say. I think that's correct, yes. Yeah, right. Um, we would have said uh, the United States uh, are – and uh, after the progressive reconceptualization, it's the United States uh, is. Um, instead of a, a collection of states, a federation, um, now the idea is that there's a nation. Woodrow Wilson's famous phrase, at least famous in these precincts, was Princeton in the nation's service. And this, this desire to identify a kind of moral whole, a nation, a state, or a social organism, they gave it different names, I think gave great impetus to the idea that it was, um, it was okay um, to trespass on individual liberties as long as it promoted the interests of the nation or the state or the people or society or the social organism. So how does... Um and this uh, another big factor because it's kind of interesting. Yeah. We have a cobble. We, we talk about them as evangelicals and then yeah. progressives, which a lot of people might be surprised given the people who call themselves progressives now. Uh, but we also have them as evangelical. But they're with Darwin and evolution having a huge influence on their thinking, uh, and which also seems to 
not go with the way we align these things today. How did Darwin and evolution come into their thinking uh, and what did it make them start to conclude? Right. Well, remember the, the quote uh, you, you had before about um, progressivism as being uh, essentially um, – an, uh, a concept that um, refers to the relationship of science to government and of government to the economy. Um, the science of the day, or at least the science that most influenced um, the economic reformers, uh, was uh, was Darwinism. Um, and uh, there's just no understanding um, progressive era reform without understanding um, the influence of Darwinism. It was, um, in the progressive view, what made these brand new social sciences just barely established uh, scientific. Um, that's one of the reasons we do history. Economics today doesn't uh, have make much. Uh, doesn't have a whole lot to do with uh, evolution or with Darwinism, and has a lot to do with mathematics and statistical approaches. But uh, at the turn of the century and and until the end of the First World War, um, evolutionary thinking uh, was was at the heart of the science that um, underwrote. Economics and the other and and the other new social sciences, um, which were uh, in, at least in the progressive view, uh, to guide uh, the administrative state in its relationship to economy and polity. What does Darwinian thinking look like in practice for the the policy preferences of the progressives? I mean, I assume we're not just talking about we need to breed out undesirable traits or something of that sort. So how does it? How does the specifics of Darwin apply to their broader agenda? Well, Darwin does does many things uh, for the progressives. Uh, Darwin, um, by himself, is 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 sort of um, a figure that they admire. Sort of, uh, he's 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 a disinterested man of science, concerned only with the truth. And um, uninterested in profit, like say a greedy capitalist, uninterested in power, like say uh, a greedy politician. I mean, Darwin is kind of a, a synecdoche, if you like, for the progressive conception of what uh, a scientific expert does. Um, more than that, uh, I think that they, they, you know, the progressives, and and by the way, many other intellectuals too, socialists and conservatives alike, um, were able to find whatever they needed in Darwin. Darwin was so influential um, in the Gilded Age and in the progressive era uh, that everybody um, found something uh, useful for their political and intellectual uh, purposes um, during the Gilded Age and the progressive era. Take competition, for example. Uh, if you were a so-called social Darwinist, um, you could say that competition uh, was survival of the fittest. Herbert Spencer's phrase that Darwin eventually borrowed himself and that therefore um, that those who succeeded uh, in economic life were in some sense fitter. Uh, the progressives could use other ev evolutionary thinkers and say, wait a second, not so. Fitter doesn't necessarily mean better. Fitter just means better adapted to a particular environment. Um, so that's uh, – competition would be an example of Darwinian thinking um, that was um, influential uh, in the way that progressives uh, thought about uh, the way an economy works. But they were particular. I mean they weren't laissez-faire and I, I know at one point you mentioned that the <clears> – <throat> I think you said that it was either the the American Economic Association or maybe sociology was started partially against William Graham Sumner. Was it, was it sociology? Uh, uh, William Graham Sumner was very influential on creating a counter movement to him and he is sort of a – a proto-libertarian or libertarian figure who was laissez-faire, but they were absolutely not. Yeah, that's quite right. Um, Sumner is the bete noir of the economic reformers. He was um, a, a, of a slightly earlier generation, the generation of 1840. 
and he was the you know, the the avatar, as you say, of free markets and of small government. And Sumner was um, the man, Ely, Richard T. Ely, sort of uh, the standard bearer of progressive economics, said that he organized the American Economic Association uh, to oppose. Um, yeah, Sumner was, in the end, the only uh, economist who was not asked to join um, the American Economic uh, Association. Uh, so much was he sort of personally associated um, with uh, laissez-faire. Now, of course, they were accused, and this is an important historical point because you mentioned the social Darwinism and I think I can almost hear your scare quotes uh, through, through the line because uh, that, that idea of Sumner and Herbert Spencer being um, Darwinists of a, of a sort that sort of wanted to let people die uh, is, a, is a little bit overextended. Uh, I mean uh, Spencer definitely had some evolutionary ideas about society. Um, but but the social Darwinist thing doesn't really come in until the fifties, if I understand correctly. But yeah, social Darwinism uh, is is a is really an anachronism applied to the progressive era. Um, I I think we can safely um, you know ascribe the influence of that term uh, term to Richard Hofstadter, who coined it in uh, his his dissertation, which was published in. Um, during the Second World War. Um, it, it is true, of course, that you could find uh, apologists for laissez-faire. Uh, you could find uh, people who said that uh, you know, economic success was not a matter of luck or of fraud or of coercion, but was deserved, uh, was justified. Um, th there were lots of defenders of laissez-faire on various grounds, and Spencer and Sumner, uh, it's fine, they fit that description. Um, but neither, neither of them were particularly Darwinian. Uh, Spencer was a rival of Darwin's. He thought his theory was, well, it was prior. He thought it was better, and um, he coined the term evolution. And Sumner really wasn't much uh, of a Darwinist at all. If you look through his work, it's only only dotted with uh, a few um, Darwinian references. I, I think what, what, um, what Hofstadter did, and he was such a graceful writer, is he coined a, a new term um, that sounded uh, kind of unpleasant. And um, if, you, if you look through the entire literature, which um, I've done, you will be hard-pressed to find a single person uh, who identifies him or herself as a social Darwinist. Uh, you won't find a journal of social Darwinism. You won't find uh, laboratories of social Darwinism. You won't find international societies for the promotion of social Darwinism. Um, but ironically, eugenics, <laughs> you will find all of those things. You will find all of those things. <laughs> now, uh, actually, could you explain what eugenics is uh, before we jump into the, the, uh, the truly distasteful part of this episode? Well, eugenics is um, just uh, in the progressive era what it meant, um, the period of, of, of my book, is uh, the social control of, of human heredity. Um, it's the idea that human heredity, just like anything else, um, guided by good science and overseen by um, socially minded experts uh, can improve human heredity just like it can improve government. It can make government good. It can make the economy more efficient and more just and so too uh, can we do the same for human heredity. And eugenics was – I mean I think big is even an understatement of, of at least the first two decades of the 20th century and, and into the third and fourth decade, but especially the first two decades. Yeah, there was an extraordinary intellectual vogue uh, for eugenics uh, all over the world, um, not just in, in, in the United States. Um, eugenics, uh, it, it's very difficult um, viewed in retrospect. That is viewed through the sort of crimes that were committed um, – uh, by Nazi Germany in the middle of the 20th century, uh, it, it's, it's very difficult to see uh, how what is a term that is, is, is a dirty word could actually be regarded as sort of the height of um, high-mindedness and, and social concern. Um, but it was, in fact, uh, at the time. And um, 
all across uh, American society, um, eugenics was popular. It was popular uh, among uh, the new experimental biologists, um, who we now call geneticists. Um, it was certainly popular among the new social scientists, the economists, uh, and others who were staffing uh, the uh, the bureaus at the administrative state and sitting in chairs in, in the university. And it was popular uh, among politicians too. Um, it was uh, there were many journals of of eugenics. There were many eugenics societies. Uh, they had international and national conferences. Um, hundreds, probably thousands of, of scholars were happy to call themselves eugenicists and to advocate for eugenic policies of various kinds. Um, there's a there's a book published in, I think, around 1924 by Sam Holmes, who's a Berkeley zoologist. Um, and it has, uh, there's like six or 7,000 titles on eugenics in, in the in bibliography. How did the eugenicists of the time think about what they were doing or think about the people that they were doing it to? Well, first because we should ask what they were doing. <laughs> we haven't well, actually got to that. But I mean in general, like the, the attitude towards the, the very notion of this because we can – even setting aside the, the horrors of what Nazi Germany did, from our modern perspective looking back at this with the, the debates that we have and the struggle we have to allow people to say define the family the way that they choose and just the – the overwhelming significance in you know the scope of one's life and the way one lives in in that decision to have children and become a parent and eugenics no matter i mean no matter the details of it is ultimately taking that choice away from someone or making that choice for them and it seems just profoundly dehumanizing and did they consciously or unconsciously was there a dehumanizing element to it did they think of the people that they were going to practice this on as somehow less and so therefore deserving of less autonomy or was there a distancing from that element of it? Well, it's important to remember the answer to the question is yes. Um, uh, the professionals, if you will, in, in the eugenics movement, the sort of the professionals and the propagandists um, certainly saw um, – uh, immigrants from Southern and Eastern Europe, immigrants from Asia, African Americans, um, the mentally and physically disabled, as inferiors, as uh, as as unfit. Um, there's just no question about it. But what we need, what one important caution here again, um, is that um, there were very few uh, people at the time proposing anything like. Um, herding inferiors into death chambers. Eugenic policies were were uh, were much less extreme. Um, so when we encounter it in the context of of say economic reform, uh, it comes up uh, in um, immigration, for example. Um, if you regard um, immigrants uh, from Southern and Eastern Europe and from Asia. As, as unfit, um, as threats uh, to American racial integrity uh, or as economic threats to American uh, working men's wages, um, that's a eugenic argument. You're saying that um, when, when you argue that they will sort of reduce uh, American hereditary vigor, that's a eugenic argument. Uh, it doesn't have to involve something um, as ugly as, say, coercive sterilization um, or, or worse. Um, th there's many ways of, of uh, which I, I think are, are um, you know, strange to us in retrospect of thinking about the law, be it immigration reform or minimum wages uh, or maximum hours, as uh, a device for um, – Keeping uh, the inferior out of the labor force or 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 out of the country altogether. Yeah, let's go. Yeah, the last um, uh, third of your book kind of goes through these. We um, we have a chapter called "Excluding the Unemployable." Um, so, can you talk a little about what about what that entailed? Sure. 
Um, the the unemployable is is a is a kind of buzz phrase uh, that I think was probably coined by Sidney and and Beatrice Webb, um, who were Fabian socialists, founders of the London School of Economics, and um, whose work was was widely read um, by uh, American progressives uh, and with whom American progressives had a, a, a very kind of fruitful um, transatlantic um, interaction with. Um, the idea, it's, it's, it's a misnomer, of course, because the unemployable uh, refers to people who, many of whom were actually employed. And, and the idea here uh, is, is that the, a, a certain category of worker um, is is willing to work for wages below uh, what progressives regarded as, as as a living wage or a fair wage, and that these sorts of people, um, who were often called feeble-minded uh, when they were mentally disabled or defectives when they were physically disabled, um, were um, were were doing is sort of transgressing in multiple ways. The first thing was by accepting lower wages, they were undermining um, the deserving American uh, working man, where American really means Anglo-Saxon. The second thing is because they were willing to uh, accept low wages, uh, the American worker was unwilling to do so, uh, to accept these low wages. And so instead opted to have smaller families. Um, that argument went by the name of race suicide. So the undercutting inferior worker, because he was racially predisposed to accept uh, or innately predisposed to accept lower wages, meant that the Anglo-Saxon native, if you will, uh, scare quotes around native, uh, had fewer children. And as a result, um, the inferior strains were out breeding the superior strains, and the result was uh, what um, Edward A. Ross called race suicide. Now, that sounds like the movie Idiocracy. <laughs> if you've ever, you ever seen this movie or I'm not, not familiar with it. Oh, well, that's yeah. big. So, but the, I wanted to clarify something that, that might uh, shock our listeners that um, – and you mentioned this briefly a little bit, like for the economists, for members of the American Economics Association, at the time, some of them thought of the minimum wage as valuable precisely because it unemployed these people. So whereas now we're actually having this fight about whether or not the minimum wage unemploys anyone, it seems like there was a few doubts that it, it did unemploy people and the people that unemployed were the were the Unprodu are the, uh, the unemployable, unproductive workers who, who shouldn't be employed in the first place. That's right. Um there's um, there's a very long list of people who, uh, at one time or another, uh, just a, almost comically, if it weren't sad, uh, long list of of groups that were vilified as as being inferior. As I say, physically disabled, mentally disabled, um, coming from Asia or Southern Europe or Eastern Europe, um, African American. Although the progressives weren't terribly worried about the African Americans, um, at least outside the South, uh, until they started um, the Great Migration and became economic competitors in the factories um, as well. So this um, very long list of inferiors creates a kind of regulatory problem, which is uh, how, how are we going to identify them? Um, and um, so you can, if you think, for example, that uh, um, a Jew from Russia or an Italian from the Mezzogiorno is inferior, um, how are you going to know uh, that uh, they're Jewish or that they're from southern Italy? Um, their passport doesn't specify necessarily. Um, so one way, of course, is, is, is to take out your handbook uh, the Dictionary of the Races of America, or another more clever way ultimately is to simply set a minimum wage so high that uh, all unskilled labor will uh, be unable to legally uh, come to America well, that because was, they'll be priced out. And that was also true of uh, – it goes a little bit past your book, but um, the 
the migration of African Americans north uh, had some influence on the federal minimum wage of the New Deal, if I remember. Yes, correctly. it did, and also the also uh, Mexican immigrants as well. Um, the The idea of inferiors uh, threatening. Um, "Quote unquote Americans um, or Native Americans," quote unquote, um, is is a trope that recurs uh, again and again uh, and again, uh, not just in the Progressive Era but also in the New Deal. And it is, I suppose, shocking and, and bizarre to see the minimum wage um, as uh, hailed for its uh, eugenic virtues. Uh, but w one very convenient way of of solving this problem of how do we identify the inferiors is to simply assume that they're low skilled and therefore unproductive and a binding minimum wage will ensure uh, that the unproductive are, are kept out or if they're already in the labor force, uh, they'll be idled and the deserving, that is to say the productive workers who were always assumed of course to be Anglo-Saxon will keep their jobs and, and get a raise. It's a very appealing notion. And you're quite right um, that today, you know, most of the debate uh, or a good part of the minimum wage debate concerns the question of uh, how much unemployment you get for a given increase in the minimum. Um, uh, but there's no question that any disemployment from a higher minimum is, is, is a social cost that's undesirable. Um, in the progressive era, it was not seen. Uh, as a social cost. It was not seen as a bug. It was seen as a desirable feature. And this is why progressivism has uh, um, made a virtue of it, um, precisely because it did exclude so many, so many folks who were regarded as uh, deficient, deficient um, in their heredity, um, deficient in their politics, uh, deficient in, in many other ways as well. What struck me when you were running through the the policies that they wanted the so the minimum wage in order to exclude these people or the concerns about immigration right. is how many of them maybe I mean not in not in the motives behind them necessarily not in the stated motives but in the the specifics of the policies and some of the concerns look very much like what you hear today. You know, they they seem to be conventional wisdom about the need to keep out unskilled immigrants. Um, you hear stuff about their, you know, that there's there's too many of them in the population, and that that will ultimately cause problems if they you know tip over into a majority or the or the existing minimum wage. But they don't seem they don't have the what we think of as terrifically ugly motives behind them. And so, is there? Like that that historic change, because it seems odd that if if the motives and and the the desires and the attitudes have shifted, we would have seen the the resulting policies shift. So how did that how did we get that transition from you know keeping the a desire for the policies of the progressive era, but shifting our attitudes, our sense of virtue to something that would see these the motives behind the policy of the progressive era as so repugnant? Well, I think that you know uh, we teach freshmen um, in economics uh, to make this um, fairly bright distinction between the so-called positive and the normative, right? So the positive question is what are the effects of the minimum wage on employment, and what are the effects of the minimum wage on um, output prices, and what are the effects of the minimum wage on the income distribution. Um, and you, you can sort of uh, think about those questions um, without sort of uh, tipping over in, onto the normative side, uh, which is, uh, it, it is, is it a good thing or a bad thing that a particular class of worker, namely the, the, the very unskilled, are, are likely to, to be harmed um, uh, at all? So it's you. You can, I think, in a way, it's it's partly a parable of, about the, um, you know, the capacity of of sorting uh, so-called scientific claims from from so-called uh, uh, normative uh, or or ethical matters. Um, 
you know, my, my own view is it's one can be a supporter of the minimum wage, of course, uh, without, you know, having um, repugnant views uh, about the folks who um, are going to lose their job if we uh, raise the minimum wage uh, too high. Uh, yeah, of course. That goes that, with, I think that goes without saying. Well, that's an interesting question about what are the lessons um, yeah. from this. But I, I, wanted, uh, I wanted to ask you about one more thing before we kind of uh, get to that question which about – because there's another one uh, which we didn't touch on which might surprise people which is – Excluding women, there's a, so we got we went through. There was some sterilization, uh, which we didn't talk about much, uh, much. But you mentioned it, uh, excluding the unemployable. And we talked about immigration, and now we also have excluding women. And people might be surprised to hear that progressives were uh, actually interested in doing this. Yeah, this is a this is a well. All of these uh, accounts are are, are complex. Um, uh, the story of of uh, women's labor legislation is probably the most uh, complex uh, of all, and and that's partly because um, uh, in the in the progressive era, most labor legislation uh, was directed at women and at women only. Not all, but sort of the the pillars of of uh, the welfare state, which is to say, minimum wages, uh, maximum hours. Mothers' pensions, um, which eventually evolved into um, AFDC and welfare, um, those pillars were uh, for the, those uh, those pillars. That's that legislation was uh, women and women only. Now, there are different ways of thinking about it. Um, I think that th the thing to remember um, is that. A lot of this legislation to 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 set a, a wage floor, um, to set a maximum number of hours, uh, to give women payments, women with dependent children uh, payments uh, at home, uh, were enacted not so much to protect women from employment, the hazards of employment, but rather to protect employment from women. Uh, and when you look at the discourse, um, you do find uh, a kind of protective paternalistic line where, uh, for example, the, the famous Brandeis brief, which was used in so many court, Supreme Court cases in defense of labor legislation, uh, just sort of baldly asserts that women are the weaker sex. And that's why women, as women, uh, need to be protected from the hazards of of market work, um, they, they didn't worry so much about the hazards of domestic work. And Brandeis was a champion of. I mean, he's considered a champion of progressive era, but he did write this unbelievably sexist brief in Mueller versus Oregon. Indeed, he did, and uh, he collaborated with his sister-in-law Josephine Goldmark. And it's regarded as sort of uh, not only the case, but the brief itself is regarded as sort of a landmark and. In in uh, in legal circles, uh, so they, that there's also a, a second class of argument, uh, which is uh, still lives on today. I might add, uh, which is called the family wage, and, and this is the idea uh, that there's a kind of natural family structure wherein uh, the father is the breadwinner and the mother stays at home and tends the hearth and raises the kids, and that. Uh, male workers are entitled to a wage sufficient to support uh, a wife and, and, and other dependents. And that when women work for wages, uh, they wrongly usurp the wages that rightly belong to the breadwinner. Um, that's another argument for regulating women's employment. That's not really protecting women. That's protecting men, of course. Um, and there there were a whole host of arguments. Another argument was worried about women's sexual virtue, that if women accepted, you know, low wages at the factory, uh, they'll be tempted in, into prostitution. Uh, the, the euphemism of the day was the social vice. Um, and uh, John really Bates Clark pointed out that um, – if if five dollars a week tempts a, a factory girl into vice, then zero dollars a week, zero dollars a week will do so more surely. It's really hard to to 
decide when you going through all this stuff and you include immigration and, and all these, these these issues whether or not these people are I mean we're talking about progressives so that that's the name we all call them now but if we were going to use modern terms are they liberals or are they conservative I mean the, if the, the immigration thing looks conservative now and, and the protecting women's virtue and, and supporting the family looks conservative and the racism you know but the minimum wage want that wanting that so it's just, it's there seem to be a hodgepodge of something that that doesn't really map to anything now. Yeah, I think that's right. I think it's a mistake. I mean, one of the problems uh, that we face um, looking backwards from today is that progressivism today, a progressive today is someone on the left, someone on the left wing of the Democratic Party, say. And that's not what progressive meant um, in the progressive era. There certainly were plenty of folks uh, on the left who were progressives, but uh, there were also right progressives too. Men like Theodore Roosevelt um, would would be a, a, a canonical sort of right progressive. Um, Roosevelt ran, as as you know, as to on the progressive ticket in 1912, handing the White House to Woodrow Wilson in so doing. Um, yeah, I think uh, you know one of the uh, you know the historiographic lessons of the book is uh, uh, be careful projecting contemporary categories backwards in time. Um, you know the original progressives um, they defended human hierarchy. They were Darwinists. Um, they either ignored or justified Jim Crow. They were moralists. Um, they were evangelicals. They they promoted the claims of of um, the nation over individuals, um, and they had this, of course, heroic conception of their own roles as experts. Um, that's very different from from what twenty uh, first century uh, progressives are about. Um, the twenty first century progressives uh, couldn't be more different in some respects. They're not evangelicals. They're they're very secular. Um, they emphasize racial equality and and minority rights. They're nervous about nationalism. They don't. They're not imperialists like the progressives were. They're they're unhappy with too much Darwinism in in their social science. So so in these respects, contemporary progressives are are very different um, from um, their namesakes. On the other hand, though, having said that, and that's a very important point. Just because they share a name doesn't mean they share uh, everything. Is uh, there are some things uh, about the progressives that I think still carry over to today, um, and one is this uh, sort of uh, this combination of uh, statism and and expertise. The idea that our politics should be uh, scientific, uh, not political, if you will, and that um, economic life. Uh, is best uh, governed by the visible hand of an administrative state that investigates and regulates and supervises um, the economy. And that and maybe that's the the lesson for for what we can take from this because that can run amok under certain circumstances. Yes, it can. I mean, it, it, one of the lessons I, I think uh, I learned in, in writing this book is, uh, and it was, it, I have to say, it was a hard won lesson, um, is that um, the, the history of bad ideas like uh, coercive eugenics is just as interesting and as important as the history of good ideas. And that's because. Um, Bad ideas that were historically important, like like eugenics, um, were thought almost by definition, are, were thought by many people to be a good idea at the time. So we need we need to be uh, we need to be wary of 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 scientism. Maybe that's the right word, uh, particularly in the social sciences like economics. I mean, it really, it, hard as it is to understand viewed from today, uh, eugenics was seen as the best science of the day. It was something a, a high-minded person had to get behind, and in, indeed, nearly everybody did. Um, so I think that that is another lesson for today, is uh, particularly in economics and particularly 
if you're an advocate of of an extensive expert um, state's involvement in the economy is you really better sh- be sure uh, your science uh, is good. And I can guarantee you that 100 years hence, uh, you know, when uh, there's a podcast looking back at us, um, there, there will be some ideas that we think of as uh, not only scientific, um, but profoundly important that they will think of as uh, reprehensible. Thank you for listening. Free Thoughts is produced by Evan Banks and Mark McDaniel. To learn more, find us on the web at www.libertarianism.org.